I was introduced as a, an extraordinary expert, but in fact, uh, I have, over the past 40 years, spent a, a lot of time trying to figure out pastoral nomads, of whom the Mongols are one, and Genghis Khan is the emblematic pastoral nomad. I've had a lot of trouble uh, f figuring them out. It really took my son to uh, make me understand why. When he was about five or six uh, in school, they were trying to get them to start reading, and they would, the teacher would give them an assignment, would give them a question, they'd draw a picture and uh, write down what was in the picture. Uh, one of the assignments was, what does your father like to do? And uh, the other kids had, my father likes to play golf, my father likes to build cabinets, uh, my father likes to fix cars, my father likes to play tennis. My kid said, my father likes to sit. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, very hard for sitters to understand pastoral nomads, and that's uh, the reason this talk may be somewhat abbreviated. Uh, in any case, uh, Genghis Khan and, and the Mongols uh, have been written about for hundreds of years uh, and in two separate ways. In one way, by scholars in, up until the 1980s, uh, scholars were interested in philology. And so you would have in, in an article one line and then footnotes for the rest of the page explaining what was, where the derivation of this particular Mongol word came from, Turkic, Persian, Chinese, whatever. And then the next page would be the continuation of the footnote and so on. Uh, very useful, but unreadable. The other kind of uh, approach was to perceive of and to write about the Mongols and Genghis Khan in particular as barbarians who raped, murdered, pillaged, and had made no particular great contribution to world civilization. In the 1980s, uh, a, a group of Mongol scholars, those of us in Mongol studies, about two of us, uh, <laughs> Uh, decided that we needed a, a more balanced evaluation of Genghis, and uh, we began to point out that uh, the Mongol period witnessed the beginning of kind of global history. It's the first time that there was direct contact between Europe and China, uh, not just through Marco Polo, but through uh, other merchants and missionaries and so on, and that the Mongols did play some sort of important role that had not been previously addressed. Uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, avoided the question of uh, tremendous pillaging, murder, uh, and the damage that, that, the, that the Mongols uh, wrought in, uh, throughout the areas that they finally conquered. But it was a, a kind of more balanced picture. Well, uh, the problem when you start doing that is that popularizers jump on the bandwagon. And so there were a number of popularizers who uh, began to portray Genghis in this very her heroic light. Uh, Genghis Khan as an apostle of democracy. Uh, Genghis Khan, uh, there was a, a book called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Genghis Khan had nothing to do with the modern world. Uh, I mean, maybe Einstein had something to do with the modern world, but Genghis Khan certainly did not. Uh, or uh, Genghis believed in uh, women's rights, uh, or uh, he, uh, you know, it, it went on and on, uh, this kind of thing, that the, the Mongols had an impact on the Renaissance in Europe. Uh, this kind of ahistorical stuff went, went berserk. And so, again, we have to, go back a little bit and try to provide a more balanced picture. Uh, it's very difficult because, as I said, I've just written a review for the, probably just came out for the Times Literary Supplement, uh, the TLS, in which I point out that there have been 12 biographies of Genghis Khan since 2005, just in English, not to mention Japanese and Mongol and so on and so forth. So it gets very difficult to uh, try to deal and try to dispel some of the myths that have uh, developed uh, regarding Genghis and, and the Mongols.
Uh, very difficult to do also because we don't have the Mongol point of view. Uh, there's only one Mongol source uh, of the 13th century that's of any use in terms of Genghis, something called the secret history of the Mongols. It's a combination of myth and history, and so it's, and oftentimes it's difficult to separate the two, so it's very difficult to get an accurate picture of Genghis from, uh, from that work. We are therefore dependent upon the writings of the people that the Mongols conquered. The most important sources are Chinese and Persian. And then, of course, you have Armenian, Georgian, Russian, uh, Korean, Japanese. The Mongols uh, played a role in all of these countries. And so you're getting a kind of biased view of the Mongols because uh, the writing is from the point of view of those whom they defeated. And that presents very, very difficult problems. What I'm going to try to do tonight is, is again, try to provide a balanced picture, of, although obviously uh, everybody has his own prejudices, and I have my own about Genghis. Uh, but I first want to show you where they came from. Uh, and I deliberately took a, a picture, a, a map, that showed the USSR, because the USSR, the Soviet Union, had a tremendous impact on Mongolia from 1921 till 1990. And one of the things that, that the Soviets insisted on was that Genghis Khan was a feudal conqueror, backward, and should not be considered as someone important in Mongolian history. And in fact, they demanded sometimes that Mongolian history textbooks not portray Genghis at all, not mention Genghis at all. So uh, what's happened since then, when we get to uh, the modern Mongolian conceptions of Genghis, you'll understand why they've, the Mongols have gone overboard in, in their uh, evaluation of Genghis. Keeping all of this in mind, there are a lot of questions about Genghis's life that we don't know exactly even when he was born. There are two possible dates, one 1162, another 1167. The Mongols have decided to opt for the first one, 1162, uh, for a variety of pretty good historical reasons, but there, there are good historical reasons for choosing the latter as well. In any case, what we know about him is that he probably descended from the lower nobility. Uh, we think that is the case because unlike normal situations, it was he, when, when he was betrothed, it was he that went into the wife's family rather than the other way around. And so it's, it's presumed that the wife's family did derive from a higher nobility. He was taken uh, by his father at the age of eight or nine to the uh, prospective wife's family. And uh, the father left him there, went back, and the father uh, unfortunately met a bad ending. He came across a group that uh, was hostile to the Mongols. They uh, invited him to dinner, poisoned him, he died, and at that point uh, Genghis had to go back. His actual name was Temujin at that point. Genghis Khan is a title. Uh, Temujin goes back to his family, and of course without the, the patriarch or the paternal uh, figure in uh, most of the retainers that uh, had worked for his family left them and left him and his, and his mother and a couple of half-brothers. They were on their own and uh, they lived a, a very uh, meager existence. Uh, they found themselves in, in great danger on a number of occasions. Uh, and Chinggis's response to this was to build so-called blood brotherhoods. He would always find someone who had more than he had, or had a higher title, or had more wealth, to develop a blood, uh, uh, blood brother relationship, and then move on. Uh, what often happened was that the blood brotherhood was severed, and the secret history of the Mongols tells us that it was the other guy who was at fault. But it happened so often 
that it makes you think that Genghis was using one person after another. When he got to a certain stage where he didn't need his blood brother, he moved on and uh, found another more powerful and wealthier uh, blood brother. Um, as he went on, he began getting retainers. And by the age, by, by the age of 25 or so, he had built up a, a large group of, of people uh, supporting him. And one of the reasons they supported him was that any spoils that they were able to get were divided pretty equally. He didn't uh, gobble up all of the wealth that accrued to his group. Secondly, he based everything on, in terms of merit. And uh, he did not focus on someone's previous social status. Whoever proved himself uh, as a loyal retainer, or a good fighter, or good in, in terms of the economy, was promoted. Those could be from a lower class background, for that matter. And so people got attached to him, became quite loyal to him. Now, uh, we often see this kind of map. That is, the Mongols taking over and creating the largest contiguous land empire in world history, stretching from Korea to southern Russia in the north, and then in the south from the Middle East to uh, southern China. Uh, that had nothing to do with Genghis Khan, and that's one of the myths. Genghis Khan was not a great conqueror. Uh, if we go back here, we can understand what his greatest achievement was. His greatest achievement was uniting all of the various tribespeople in Mongolia, unifying the Mongols for the first time in history. And Mongolia, it's very difficult to do. Mongolia is four times the size of France. It's an enormous territory with a, with a population at that point of less than a million people. So bringing them all together from the disparate parts of the country was a remarkable achievement. Putting them into one force was, was the, the achievement that, uh, that he deserves credit for. The conquests were really uh, done by his sons and grandsons. Uh, in fact, he very rarely uh, took over any or occupied any territory that he defeated. Uh, after building up his power, and, and in 1206, uh, he gets the title of Genghis Khan. Uh, and it used to be thought that the title meant Khan of all within the oceans. The problem is, like, Mongolia is landlocked. So that doesn't make much sense. It, uh, more likely, it means fierce Khan, fierce ruler. He gets that title, and uh, from the very beginning, he begins to have trouble with people down, oh, sorry. Uh, people in that domain over there, in Northwest China, which controlled the trade routes. All the trade routes had to go through here uh, to the west. And uh, they're charging enormous tariffs, and so Chinggis has to go down there and attempt to defeat them uh, so that uh, uh, his caravans can go more readily to the west. He goes down there, and uh, here's another myth that he was such a great military technician, everything worked out perfectly. In fact, what he tried to do was divert uh, the dams in the area, divert the waters in the area to flood the, uh, this particular khanate down here in northwest China. But in fact, what happened was the reverse. Uh, they didn't know how to do it, and the water flooded over his own soldiers. Uh, the, uh, eventually, he did succeed in defeating this group, or at least uh, getting their submission. But he went back to Mongolia and did not keep occupation troops. He got what he wanted, that is, lower tariffs, and that was it. Uh, 
The usual interpretation, another myth that uh, has developed, is that Genghis Khan had the intention of being the conqueror of the world. He was given a, uh, a mandate from the sky god of the Mongols to take over the world. Ridiculous. Uh, Genghis Khan didn't know what was outside of Mongolia, and he had, uh, as we'll see, he had no intention of occupying more territory. Next engagement was down here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, down here around Beijing. Uh, this group, which controlled northern China, uh, would not trade with him. And trade is the lifeblood of the Mongols. Uh, Mongolia is a very, very, has a very, very fragile economy. Even today, there are terrible winters called Zuds every, approximately every five years in which large numbers of animals died. In the period, let's say, from 1999 to 2002, in a modern era, uh, the animals, there were three successive bad winters, and the animal census went from 33 million to about 21 million. They lost a third of their animals during that three-year period. So you can imagine a bad winter in, in uh, what that would do in Mongolia in the 13th century. So Mongolia desperately needed, when there were Zuds, they desperately needed food, particularly from northern China. And uh, an engagement occurred here around 1215. They, they, he defeated the people in Beijing, mostly because he used Chinese soldiers who had siege engines, who had mangonels, catapults, because these were cities. He wasn't taking over uh, countryside. He was taking over cities that had walls uh, around them. So he needed projectiles to attack these cities and those were provided by the Chinese. Uh, defeats them, gets what he wants in terms of trade, goes back to Mongolia. Third engagement, and the last one for, for uh, Chinggis, was out here in uh, Central Asia. Uh, the ruler of that region One of the governors of that region stopped a Mongol caravan and killed 400 Mongols. When Genghis learned about this, he immediately asked the ruler of the area to send the governor to him for trial and probably execution. Uh, the ruler instead killed one of the ambassadors that, that uh, Genghis had sent and sent the others back. From the Mongol standpoint, that's the most heinous thing you can do. They believed in the absolute inviolability of ambassadors. And so they had to avenge that, uh, that, that murder. Sets forth on the largest campaign with, it said, 200,000 men. Now, this is going through some of the most desolate terrain in the world. Deserts, d very daunting desert, lofty mountains. And uh, it's not so much the men, but it's the horses that they took with them. Each cavalryman had about four horses. So you're, talk you're talking about taking 800,000 horses and finding enough uh, food for them to survive uh, in this long march towards Central Asia. Demanding effort, we don't know how he did it. Uh, a group of Columbia ecologists now claim that uh, this area was wet during that time. It was not as desert-oriented as it is today, and that, was, that facilitated the efforts of the Mongols to find enough grass for their animals and facilitated their efforts to move into Central Asia. Now this group over here in Central Asia, this group mostly made up of Muslims, put up the stiffest resistance. And so this is the area where the Mongols were the most brutal. They devastated some of the cities that were found in this area. Uh, Samarkand, for example, over here, 
uh, Bukhara, other places were devastated. And this was the only place they uh, decided to occupy. This was really the, uh, the only conquest that occurred during Genghis Khan's time. Um, unfortunately for Genghis, the, the, uh, this area had great contact with Persia. And the Persians were the great historians of this era. Uh, great historian named Juvaini, and then se several decades later, a man named Rashid ad-Din, and they, of course, portrayed the Mongols in the most negative light imaginable. Uh, they uh, exaggerated the number of people killed. In, in one case, they say a whole town was wiped out, a whole city was wiped out. Not true because we notice Chinese travelers are going there and trading a couple of years later. Uh, but that, since Persian was the kind of lingua franca of the 13th century, it was the English of the 13th century because people in Europe spoke per Persian, people in China did, and people along the trade routes. This made the Mongols, this gave the Mongols a tremendous bad press. And uh, it, you know, certainly a lot of things were done, a lot of damage was done, a lot of uh, killing and so on, but uh, it, not as exaggerated as the uh, sources would have us believe. By 1225, Chinggis starts to go back to uh, Mongolia, and as he's going back, he meets this group that he originally fought against, the group in northwest uh, China, starts a battle with them, and then dies in 1227. Um, We don't know how he died. Uh, the the uh, one theory is that he uh, was hit by an arrow on the shoulder and died as a result of a cumulative uh, response to that. Another, that he just died of old age. Um, and another, I have to um, give you a little background on this. About three or four years ago, uh, Robert Krulowicz, who's a very good science uh, reporter uh, for NPR, uh, called me up and said I'd li he'd like to talk about Genghis Khan. I said, sure. We met at a local diner, and I, you know, he was taping me for an hour, an hour and a half, uh, and pretty much what I've told you in more detail. And then he said, well, aren't there colorful stories about his death? Uh, I said, well, yeah, there's some weak, wacko stories uh, that uh, one of the stories is that he had taken uh, the wife of this town good, uh, this leader over here for himself. She didn't want to be taken, and so she put a knife in her vagina, and as they were having sex, that was the end of Genghis Khan. Um, <laughs> that was the only thing that NPR put on the, on the radio. <laughs> So I get students who think I'm some kind of pervert. <laughs> In any case, uh, the, uh, he does die. There are lots of stories about uh, how he was transported from that area to northeastern Mongolia, and I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. But I did want to show you the, the, what facilitated the uh, life and mobility of the Mongols. This is a ger, a, a Mongolian tent that Chinggis probably grew up in, and uh, he, uh, it's ideal for a nomadic group because it be, can be put together in about 45 minutes, can be dismantled in 45 minutes, and is extraordinarily warm in winter, terrific in summer. They just take off the flap on the top of the tent there, and it gets fairly cool. The second, the second kind of thing that uh, gave Genghis and his uh, Mongol armies a tremendous advantage was the horse. Uh, they were terrific cavalrymen, and they could shoot the bow and arrow accurately while going at full speed. 
Uh, and so when they took over China eventually, uh, the Chinese artists recognized that they could gain the favor of the Mongols uh, by portraying horses. And so this is a horse, uh, this is a painting by Zhao Mengfu, one of the great Chinese painters of the, uh, of the Mongol era. Uh, and as a result of this painting and as a result of other things, uh, he was given a kind of no-show job by the Mongols and allowed to paint and, uh, and do his calligraphy. On the other side of the world, where the Mongols were in charge in Persia, again, horses predominate in uh, the kind of uh, artwork that they produce. Genghis Khan died, right? And uh, this is a portrait of Genghis, uh, uh, Ch Genghis's funeral cortege. Uh, he's in that uh, site there. Uh, probably the, this didn't happen. This is about 200 years later. About 40 years after his death, uh, it was claimed that his body was taken and uh, by a caravan. Anybody that was met en route was immediately slaughtered. Uh, they got to the place where in northeastern Mongolia after hundreds of miles and uh, buried him in an obscure location uh, and buried with him 40 virgins and 40 horses whom we need in the afterlife. And then as they were coming out, they themselves were killed, so there'd be no opportunity for anyone to find out where Genghis was buried. Uh, probably a fake. Uh, the, the Mongols didn't know how to uh, embalm bodies, and he died in summer. It would have been extraordinary for them to travel from, central, from northwest China all the way to northeast Mongolia without the body rotting. Probably what happened was what, they did not have a, a tomb culture at that point. They developed a tomb culture when they had greater contact with China and Persia. Probably what happened was that uh, his body was left where it, le where it uh, fell and to be consumed by the animals. Because there was a very strong uh, symbiosis uh, between man and animal, and it still is. Uh, and if you go to a herder who has 150 sheep and 50 goats, he'll know exactly every single characteristic of each uh, individual animal. What kind of grass they like, what kind of feed they like, whatever. Uh, and so that's probably what happened to Genghis. Here he is in a Persian depiction. Uh, uh, one of these Persian histories that I've mentioned were illustrated, and here he's receiving his four sons. with horses obviously prominent. Then we get to this, and you notice over here, here he, here's Genghis, here's some envoys, and you have a blue and white porcelain. So you know this was not done in Genghis's time. The first uh, blue and white porcelains were, were produced 100 and over 100 years afterwards. So that uh, this is a anachronistic, but nonetheless it gives you a, a, a vision of what Genghis, like, Genghis was uh, portrayed in, uh, in that uh, time period. The problem with Genghis and with the Mongols in general was that he did not set up a succession system. You know, in China the emperor dies, son succeeds. The Mongols had different types of succession, and that really was the reason the Mongols collapsed. They were not uh, defeated, per se. Uh, they warred amongst each other, and uh, that created the disaster of the collapse of the Mongol Empire. <clears throat> um, one system that they had was that the younger brother would take over from the older brother, would marry the older brother's wife, and <clears throat> would then become the ruler. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, second, the youngest son, because the oldest sons would have been taken care of, would have had time to 
uh, develop their own wealth, their own property. The youngest son needed the protection of the father. What the Mongols chose was a third system, and that is that the nobility would get together in a meeting uh, and would choose the successor, the most meritorious of Chinggis's descendants. He had to have Chinggis's blood, but uh, he could, could be anybody, a grandson, uncle, uh, cousin, whatever. <clears throat> and as we know, different people have different points of view about who is the best person to be elected uh, in, we, we have that same problem, but we work it out peacefully. Uh, the Mongols, after the first <clears throat> successful one, there was only one, success, one succession that worked out without warfare and conflict. When that son of Genghis has died, the empire uh, broke apart into four different areas, China, uh, Persia, Central Asia, and Russia. That was the disaster for, for the Mongols. I, uh, there, there's no specific defeat that you, you can account for, uh, that you can point to as the reason for the Mongols. Uh, and this is Genghis's grandson, uh, Kublai Khan, and uh, the most successful, really, in many ways, of the Genghisids. He actually set up a government that worked uh, in China. And you can notice here, this is a <clears throat> an actual painting done in 1260. He'd just taken power, very simple uh, white tunic, uh, let me show you what happens. This is a painting done 20 years later. Uh, Genghis, like over here, has obviously enjoyed Chinese food, <laughs> and uh, he is wearing an ermine coat, very elaborate silk outfit. He's changed dramatically, and that's one of the reasons the Mongols today consider Kublai as not as significant as somebody who broke away from Mongol tradition became like the Chinese, and they don't consider him to be a great hero in the same sense that they consider his grandfather to be. I'm going to... Uh, this is a, a depiction which uh, you may be, f be familiar with. Uh, by this time, Kublai Khan has become a sage European king of some sort. Those are the Polo's uncle and Marco Polo's uh, father, uh, completely different than what he was, and even more remarkable is this depiction of Kublai Khan, guy in, with a white beard. Uh, according to Marco, Kublai had become so obese and enjoyed Chinese food so much that no single horse could sustain his weight. <laughs> and so he had to be carried around on elephants. Now you notice the European, uh, the, uh, the European artist had no idea what elephants looked like. <laughs> look at the horse and look at the, uh, the elephant. What's very sad about Mongolia at the moment is, of course, most of the materials that the Mongols had were perishable. And so we find very little from Genghis's time except these two war banners that you find in the, Mongol in the National, National History Museum of Mongolia. A lot of the artifacts uh, that were found were taken by the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets excavated uh, uh, areas in Mongolia after the Second World War and brought them to uh, the Hermitage in, in uh, Leningrad. The capital city, which was begun by by Genghis and then really completed by his son. Very little left. Uh, there's this whoop, bronze lantern that uh, derived really from Chinese tradition. And then it became, when the Mongols converted to Buddhism in the 16th century, 
there, there was such resonance about this site that it became the, uh, uh, the site of the first Buddhist temple, first Buddhist monastery in, uh, in Mongolia. Another image is of this tortoise. That's another remaining piece of this. As it turns out, a German archaeologist now is digging up in this area and has found the major palace built by Chinggis Khan's uh, son. So that will be appearing in archaeological journals in the next little while. And has found a lot of other stuff. Uh, the Japanese have set up a museum there. And uh, there are some things relate to Genghis, some to his son, and uh, publications will come out that will show a great deal more about the Mongols and about the Mongol Khans uh, than, than we now know. Okay. Now, what, what is the significance of, uh, of Genghis? I think one element is that he brought the world together. Uh, the Mongols witnessed the first time that there was direct contact all across Eurasia. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that Genghis had a very positive attitude towards trade. Unlike the Chinese, who regarded merchants as parasites, the Chinese, in theory, because of Confucian ideas, regarded the merchants as uh, people who did not produce anything worthwhile, who were only involved in the exchange of goods, and therefore were, were, were given a lower social status. The Mongols, who needed trade desperately, valued merchants, valued trade, and the result is that you have a revival of the Silk Roads trade during the Mongol era, and a much more, uh, much more trade, much more commerce going across Eurasia than had been the case earlier, in part because of Genghis's own attitude towards trade. Secondly, religious, to religious toleration. Uh, the Genghis realized that if he was going to rule a multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire, that he and his descendants had to uh, provide for a certain amount of toleration of a variety of different religions. And so Buddhism, um, Islam, uh, Nestorian Christianity were all supported and patronized during his era. And in fact, his daughter-in-law, who was Kublai Khan's uh, mother, was a Christian. Uh, she was a Nestorian Christian, uh, a, a her heretical form of Christianity that was forced out of Europe and eventually reached the Mongols. That doesn't mean that they were, you know, wonderfully religiously tolerant. They it was a tactical strategy. They believed that if they were able to win the favor and the allegiance of the clerics, of Buddhist monks, uh, Islamic imams, and so on, that it would be easier to rule a multi-ethnic uh, population. Thirdly, uh, as I've said, unity uh, of the Mongols was, was critical. Uh, that was brought about by Genghis. Fourth, he was the first to commission a written language for the Mongols. Uh, really remarkable for somebody who came from a very primitive, rural uh, environment to, to conceive of commissioning such a, la a written language. And that written language was used uh, by the Mongols till 1941, when Cyrillic, was substituted when in the 1940s Cyrillic was substituted for this uh, particular written language. But the other thing that we are not cognizant of is that Genghis and his direct family loved beautiful objects and this would have a tremendous impact on artistic diffusion. The, the Mongols loved gold, they loved ceramics, uh, they loved textiles, and the reason they loved textiles, of course, was portable. It was very easy to transmit uh, textiles from one region to another during the Mongols' nomadic uh, periods. And what this did was to have a tremendous impact on artistic diffusion. You'd think that this 
of porcelain, uh, the celadum, uh, which is found in the Metropolitan Museum, is Chinese. But in fact, it's Persian. Uh, the Persians adored Chinese uh, ceramics and tried to imitate them. And if you go to the Met, when you go up to the balcony, uh, you'll notice the original Chinese version and the Persian version. They're right next to each other, and you can uh, see which one uh, is better. I'll give you a clue. The Chinese one is better. <laughs> uh, again, this you'd think is Chinese. It's a phoenix, a motif that derives from China, uh, representing the, the Chinese empress. But in fact, it's Persian. The Mongols transmitted these themes to the Persians, and that had a tremendous impact on Persian art. The quintessential uh, Chinese motif, the dragon. This is on a Yuan dynasty, a Mongol dynasty uh, dragon. But then you find it in Persia, uh, in tile work in Persia. There was no such motif, no such dragon in Persian art. The, the Mongols brought it from China to Persia. And uh, this, tile, this tile work is from the summer palace that the Persians, that the Mongols built in Persia. One of the few things that we have in the West from that period, the Germans, German archeologists uh, excavated in Iran in the 1950s, were able to get some of these tile works, uh, tiles uh, to the West and they're really spectacular. The other thing that uh, becomes important, as the Mongols begin to stay in one location and don't have direct contact with Mongolia, they're going to lose their relationship with Mongol culture. And so one of the smart Mongol Khans, a great grandson of, uh, of Chinggis's, commission one of the greatest Renaissance figures in world history to write a history of the Mongols. And of course, this guy who happened, started out as Jewish, but converted to Islam, became a doctor, then became a minister, the prime minister of, of Iran, uh, very conversant with Chinese culture, still based in Iran, had a Chinese chef. I don't know why food becomes so important. But anyway, um, wrote this history. And uh, this is an illustration of that history, which shows you the geography part. This is a, uh, this is a Chinese decor, Nepalese person. Ne ne which is tremendous for historians, obviously, this kind of visual imagining. But again, in Persia, you have a Chinese-style mountain, Chinese-style trees. They, the Persian art was going to be infused with uh, Chinese art. And that really is a development that, uh, that comes about through Chinggis and his descendants. Um, I remember uh, this particular Persian historian, the first person who wrote a universal history, because it started with the Mongols, then it went to a history of Islam, history of Iran, history of China, history of the Jews, history of Europe. Uh, I remember as a, as a graduate student, everybody had to take a historiography course. So the great historians of, at Columbia at that point uh, would come and talk about a great German historian or a great American historian uh, or whatever. And uh, at the end of the course, the medieval historian who supervised this uh, said, if you want to come and tell us what you think of the course, come, you know. So I stupidly went and uh, I said, you know, this is a great course, but have you ever thought of having an Asian historian? And uh, he turned to me with straight face and he said, are there any? Uh, the, I think that has not changed very much in many history departments. Uh, there's still uh, American history and European history, but it doesn't extend much beyond that. Now, I want to uh, 
one last uh, great uh, work uh, that's at the Metropolitan Museum and, and is shown sometimes in the spring. In the 1980s, uh, a whole bunch of textiles deriving from the Genghisid period. Genghis established the connection with Tibet and the, the Genghisids, all Genghises, Genghis himself and the others who followed him, sent textiles to Tibet, to Tibet as gifts. And so in the 1980s, about 60 of these spectacular Tibet, Tibet, uh, textiles were smuggled out of Tibet. And the question arose for both the Cleveland Museum and the Metropolitan whether they should bid for them because it was obviously they were smuggled out. They were purloined uh, by uh, dealers and so on. They decided to do it uh, because otherwise they'd wind up in private collections. And this was the gem. Uh, this really shows what the Mongols did, what Genghis Khan started and did. He was not a harbinger of democracy, but he had a, a, a tremendous impact in terms of uh, cultural and artistic uh, diffusion. Uh, the, the textile can be dated, which is very unusual, because these two brothers were fighting it out. I mentioned that there was uh, difficulties in terms of succession. Uh, these two guys were fighting it out. They came to a resolution peacefully, and this guy becomes the emperor and the Khan. On this side are their wives. Here, Hindu figures, Tibetan figures up here. Uh, Indian Buddhist figures, this is a mandala, uh, Persian style bead and roundel. So you have here real depiction of what the Mongols and Genghis Khan are, are most responsible for, bringing the world together artistically. I haven't mentioned scientifically, but they did that as well. Uh, in a variety of, of different ways. And so it's not unusual that the Mongols, having gone through a difficult time after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after having uh, a terrible, since 1991, 1990, 1991, they've had a terrible uh, economy, uh, looking back, they react by portraying Genghis in an extraordinary, heroic, and divine way. So that the uh, airport in Ulaanbaatar, in the capital city, is Genghis Khan Airport. The major square is Genghis Khan Square. That's been changed over the past five years. Genghis Khan is on the mon money, paper money. Uh, there's a Genghis Khan vodka. There's a Genghis Khan beer. There's a Genghis Khan hotel, uh, actually one of the worst hotels around. Um, and uh, then they begin portraying Genghis everywhere. Uh, this is a statue in uh, the central square. It's really horrendous, but uh, it, it dominates the central square, which had a real, um, before that time, had a Soviet feel to it, but a really, uh, uh, striking in many ways, and now it's got this thing. Then you got this uh, my sculptor uh, in the middle of nowhere, it's Ville. Then you've got this in a, uh, in a meeting between President Bush and the president of Mongolia at that point. Uh, right behind them is an image of Genghis. Then you've got this, a portrait of, of Genghis uh, as a Buddhist uh, figure. Then you've got this, a uh, statue of Buddhists and a throne in one of the museums there, one of the kind of tacky museums there. Then you've got this on, on rugs. Uh, this uh, porcelain statue, which is actually larger than it looks in, in, the, uh, in this slide. Another one, and uh, we go back to the, the beginning. Um, 
Let me stop here, and if you have questions or comments, I'd be delighted to try to answer them. <laughs>